response, and uh, then we'll open it to questions. Very good. By the way, it's very dangerous to delegate to a law professor uh, a rule that says you can speak as long as you want. Very dangerous. In fact, maybe I should make that the theme of tonight's talk. Uh, uh, it's a good way of talking about uh, the issues of constitutional interpretation. So uh, I, I, I'm not quite, quite sure why you asked me to come talk to you, but I assume you wanted to hear something about my own theory and then you wanted to think, well, what in the world can we do with this theory in Canada? What use can we make of it? And so I'll start by saying that although I'm gonna be talking about the American context, um, it's also very important uh, to understand that the uh, Canadian context is different in important ways. Uh, and I'll get to, uh, to, the, uh, to those some, uh, later. I know just enough Canadian constitutional law to get me in trouble. Uh, and I, I'm certain I will get in trouble by the time this uh, episode is through. Um, and so I will try to highlight differences, how this might not really apply in Canada, how it's not really appropriate in the Canadian context and how some of this stuff is, is very, very American. All right, so, uh, so I wrote a book called Living Originalism in 2011, and there I offer uh, something that's called framework originalism or living originalism or the method of text or principle or the crazy stuff that, that Jack Balkan does. Um, so what is this all about? Well, um, the idea is that um, a framework originalism is a species of originalism. Well, what's originalism? Well, originalism is a, um, uh, is one of a number of different, uh, is a family of, um, is a family of, of uh, uh, legal theories. So that's the best way to put it. Uh, I would say it's a, a rather bizarre collection of different legal theories, all united under the, uh, the central idea uh, that uh, you should apply the constitution according to its original meaning. Now there are different variants. You should apply it according to its original intention. You should apply it according to its original understanding. Basically, they're all of all the certain forms. Something occurred at the time of adoption of the Constitution. That something matters for how you interpret it, and you should interpret it consistent with that something that was fixed at the time of adoption. So those are all original theories, and there are so many of them. Uh, we could do a whole lecture just on them. Living originalism or framework originalism is a version of it. Uh, it argues that the thing that's fixed at the time of adoption and can't be fixed again, can't be changed without amendment, is what I call the framework. Now, what's in the framework? What do we mean by the framework? So what I, I argue that the, the basic framework, it consists of the original meanings of the terms in the constitution uh, and the framers choice of rules, standards, and principles. That is their choice of the kinds of legal norms that they put in the constitution. Now, this gets us back to my original point about telling your law professor he can talk as much as he wants. If you think about a constitution, what is a constitution really? A constitution has many purposes and, and we can do a session on what are the purposes of constitution. And you can think of them protecting basic rights and liberties, uh, dividing powers, uh, guaranteeing uh, a peaceful secession of power. Uh, we noticed we had a little problem with that in the United States recently. Uh, but the most important uh, function, most basic function of constitution is to make politics possible. That is to say, it's create a framework in which people fight over power and they fight over the things they fight over in politics and keeping all that struggle for power within the bounds of law, in particular within the bounds of a constitution. So that's what the basic point of the constitution is, to make politics possible. So now you can start to see why I emphasize the idea of a framework, because the framework is the initial uh, is the initial structure through which people begin then to contest and fight over politics. So that's the idea of a framework originally, but it also leads to another idea. And, and the best way of, of uh, describing this is thinking two different ways of thinking about a constitution, uh, different way, and different ways of thinking about originalism. One I call a framework originalism and the other I call skyscraper originalism. And what do I mean by skyscraper? Well, a skyscraper is a building. The building is completely finished. It's in move-in condition. Uh, you know, all you have to, you know, I guess you put up the carpet and, uh, or something like that, move a little furniture in. But basically the building's finished and you just move in and then you practice politics. So that's a vision of a constitution that's a skyscraper, it's a finished product. A framework model is a little different. That is to say, the framework's in place, you're not gonna change that without amendment, but most of the hard work, much of the heavy lifting still has to be done. You have to build out the constitution 
Uh, now I'm going to use it in a larger sense, the small C constitution, you have to build it out so that it actually can be useful for fighting over politics. And not only that, as you build it out, as you create conventions and doctrines and, uh, uh, and uh, institutions, uh, the terrain that you fight over in politics changes too. That is to say, the constitution is a work in progress. It's being built out over time, but what always stays the same, what doesn't change, what everything ultimately can be traced back to is the basic framework. That's the key idea of, of framework originalism. And the, the premise of framework originalism is that every constitution I know of, and certainly the American constitution that I know very well, it, it's, it's always a, a work in progress. It's always in motion. The constitution of 1789 is not the same as the constitution of 1800. It's not the same as the constitution of 1820. It's not the same as the constitution of 1868 and so on and so on and so on. It's always constantly being built out. But what's being built out is not a series of new amendments because there have been amendments, but there haven't been that many of them. What's happening is institutions are built, conventions are formed, practices are put in place, doctrines are created, and there are fights over the meaning of the constitution over time. And as these things happen, the constitution is built out. So I like to make a distinction between the constitution, that is the text of the constitution, and the constitution in practice. The constitution in practice is the series of practices, institutions, conventions, doctrines, which are characteristic of constitutional law and constitutional practice. So I teach a course every year on constitutional law. The, uh, the text of the constitution takes up about, I don't know, about 14 pages in that textbook that I teach from. And, but the textbook goes on for, you know, at least a thousand, thousand and a half pages. So what the rest, what's the rest of that? Well, that's the constitution in practice and it's constantly changing over time. But let me go back then to this idea of the framework and what's in the framework. So I said before that, the, that we're interested in the original meanings of the words of the text, and we're also interested in the choice of norms. So let me say a little bit about, uh, about that. Uh, first, let me say a little bit about uh, the original meaning. When I, when I refer to the original meaning of the text, what I, I refer to is basically what were the meanings of the concepts that were used at the time. So if the concepts have changed over time, because uh, language has changed and words have changed, we're interested in what the concepts were at the time. So the, the standard example everyone uses, I used it in my book, is uh, that Article 4 uh, uh, says that the United States shall guarantee to each state a Republican form of government. And Republican here refers to a representative government, uh, anti-aristocratic, anti-monarchical. Uh, it does not refer to a government run by the Republican Party although uh, many people in the United States think that it seems to. Uh, it, and it also requires that the United States shall guarantee uh, the states a Republican form of government and protect them from domestic violence. Domestic violence does not mean what it means in the United States today, which is a battery between people who live together. It rather means riot and insurrection, that sort of thing. Uh, so the original meaning of domestic violence was riot or insurrection. It wasn't a battery between spouses. And so therefore we want the original concept. The original concept is uh, the one that counts. Uh, otherwise uh, the meaning of the constitution wouldn't be fixed. It would be subject to you know, changes in how people used words over time. And that's not what we're trying to do. So we want the, we want the original meaning. Now, sometimes the, uh, the words of the constitution have terms of art. Uh, for example, uh, um, a bill of attainder. Uh, and uh, letters of mark and reprisal, things like that. So where there are terms of art, legal terms of art, we use the uh, common law meanings of those terms at the time of adoption. However, because these are common law terms, common law terms are subject to common law evolution over time, and therefore we would interpret them subject to common law evolution. Um, then uh, when we say original meaning, we also have to take into account a bunch of other things. One, we have to take into account um, uh, uh, technological extensions. What do I mean by that? Well, uh, the uh, First Amendment uh, speaks of speech. Well, uh, does it include writing? Well, writing existed as a technology, but we have to assume that it, it also included writing. Uh, does it include um, radio? Radio didn't exist at the time, uh, so therefore we have to decide whether or not we're going to extend uh, the application of the amendment to a new technology, and that is a, a judgment call. That's a, that requires that we figure out what this amendment is about and what its purposes are, and decide how it should apply to 
technology. So these are technological extensions. Here's another example. Uh, the Constitution speaks of an army and a navy. Well, the United States has an air force. Uh, it also has apparently now a space force. At least I saw the insignia of it. Uh, so the question is, are those governed by the, uh, by the power to create an army and a navy? And if not, well, why can we have one? Uh, so once again, you have to think in terms of technological extensions. Uh, that suggests that some of the language in the Constitution uh, has to be extended uh, based upon changes in technology, but also some of it is non-literal. The, the example of speech that I gave, it's a non-literal uh, term. That is uh, what's called a synecdoche a part that stands for a larger whole. Um, in fact, if you look at the progress clause, which is the clause for intellectual property, it's full of nothing but non-literal language. It talks about authors and inventors and uh, uh, useful arts and sciences. Uh, and these terms uh, have to be understood not uh, narrowly, but in terms of uh, the, the concepts, the larger concepts they're referring to. So even if you have a conception of original meaning, originalism, you still have to have um, uh, technological extensions. You still have to understand that some of the language is to be understood non-literally. Um, that, you know, that may sound uh, terrible. Well, how will you know uh, what it is? And the answer is you know by looking at the history to see what, uh, to see what the language was and how it was used at the time. Um, uh, so um, that's what I mean when we talk about original meaning. But uh, we, we also, uh, I also mean uh, uh, what I would call a thin theory of original meaning. I'll get back to that in a second. Uh, so mark that down. But first, I want to go back to the other idea, the other idea, which is the idea of the basic norms that are in a constitution. So um, I said there were three different kinds of norms that I was interested in. There actually there are more, but there are rules, standards, and principles. And what do I mean by, the, by them? Well, a rule is a legal norm that requires relatively little, not no, but relatively little practical reasoning to apply. Uh, rules tend to be a hardwired, they, they tend to just, you know, you apply them, that's the rule. The president's term ends on January 20th, the president serves for four years, there are two houses of Congress, and so on and so forth. These are rules. Then you have standards. Standards are norms that you apply, but they require some degree of practical judgment to apply. So, for example, there is a, a Fourth Amendment, uh, uh, Fourth Amendment says no unreasonable searches and seizures. Unreasonable is a standard. And then finally, you have norms uh, that are you have, uh, norms that are principles: freedom of speech, equal protection of the laws. Uh, these uh, also require a practical judgment to apply because principles don't determine the scope of their own extension, and also principles have to be balanced against other considerations, and considerations of national security, for example. So, uh, so we have three at least three different types of norms at play in a constitution. We have rules, relatively easy to apply. There can be problems when we're not sure what is meant by a particular term in a rule. For example, uh, uh, the search, what's a search that might be subject to technological extensions, for example. We have standards like reasonableness. Uh, reasonableness is a standard and that requires judgment uh, to apply. And then finally, we have principles, freedom of speech, equal protection, and so forth. Now, if you look at constitutions around the world, including the Canadian Charter, uh, you will find that they have a combination of rules and standards and principles. And in fact, you'll find when you look at things that are sort of equivalent to uh, bills of rights or statements of fundamental rights in constitutions around the world, they often make use of standards and principles. It's not surprising because in fact, standards and principles are the best way for constitutional adopters to articulate their commitments to uh, human rights principles. And, but that means that they don't apply themselves, they have to be applied and that requires some degree of practical judgment. And that means there has to inevitably be a delegation to uh, later generations, not necessarily to judges, but to later generations to fill out and make sense of these, build precedents or what, what given whatever kind of jurisprudence the country has, uh, how to make sense of these delegations over time. And so that's really important. Whereas uh, rules uh, often appear in constitutions because you want to limit discretion. Uh, it, basically, imagine a rule in the United States that said the president shall serve a reasonable period of time. Well, imagine what Donald Trump would have done with that. Uh, in his view, a reasonable period of time is his life, and then Ivanka's life, and then Don Jr.'s life, and you know, sort of the life estate that keeps going. Um, and that's why I said it was very funny to tell a law professor that the rule is talk as long as you feel like. 
Uh, that's a very bad, bad rule. You need a rule there. You don't want a standard or a principle. You need a rule. And so that's a basic principle of constitutional design. And it, and it also explains why constitutions have different kinds of, uh, of norms in them. But the fact that, that we've just now talked about um, uh, the existence of practical judgment in the application of a constitution, combined with the other idea that I mentioned earlier, which is that a framework means that the constitution is always being built out. That is to say, it's always a work in progress. It will change over time. Uh, not the basic framework, but what's built on top of it will change, suggests another very important problem. And that problem is, well, uh, if, the, if the text is not enough uh, to decide these questions, uh, maybe you need something else. And the something else is what I call constitutional construction. And in fact, among the originalists, um, there is now a very familiar distinction that begins with Keith Whittington of Princeton University between interpretation on the one hand and construction on the other. Interpretation, in my, in my theory, uh, refers to figuring out or ascertaining what the original meaning of the concepts and terms are, uh, whether or not uh, they refer to terms of art, in which case we look to um, you know, the prof uh, professional legal ideas of what they meant, or whether they are not terms of art, in which case we apply the ordinary meaning that an ordinary person living at the time uh, would have understand them to have, right? Uh, and then the question of what kind of norm we have, that is, do we have a rule, do we have a standard, do we have a principle? So these are all questions of interpretation, uh, but they won't be sufficient uh, to resolve many, if not most, of the most contentious issues of constitutional law that arise from time to time. So for example, once you concede that the Fourth Amendment has a standard and not a, and not a rule, once you recognize that the First Amendment has a principle and that the Equal Protection Clause has a principle, then what you realize is you're going to have to implement these things over time. Um, and that's also true to a certain extent with rules, but not so much. Uh, but you're gonna have to find ways of basically making the system work. And that, uh, that process is called construction. Uh, constitutional construction. And I mean construction in two different senses, the sense of judicial construction and the sense of uh, construction by the political branches. So let me explain what I mean by that, because I think most people who focus on interpretation tend to, you know, view it from the lens of the judge. Judge interprets. Uh, well, so what, what do we mean by judicial construction? By judicial construction, we mean uh, using, uh, taking the text of the Constitution and then uh, building out a series of doctrines through decisions uh, which flesh out and give meaning to and uh, apply uh, the Constitution's guarantees. Uh, and uh, so over time, you can get a very rich uh, set of constructions on a text. Take the, the First Amendment of the United States, uh, Constitution of the United States. This is a very, very rich uh, set of doctrines that apply from the First Amendment. They're all judicial constructions. Uh, constructions are not the original meaning. So uh, they aren't binding on uh, people in the same way that the original meaning is, although they're binding to the extent they're judge-made law and people are bound by what judges say. But in terms of if you want to know what the best interpretation of the Constitution is, uh, the best construction, it may be that the current constructions of the judiciary are good ones. Uh, and maybe they're not, but they're not baked into the original meaning. So we distinguish between the original meaning and constructions built on it. Um, what about constructions by the political branches? Well, these turn out to be actually the most important of all. And this will seem strange for people who focus on judicial interpretation as the key example of interpretation. What I mean by that is simply this. If you look at the United States um, right around uh, George Washington's inauguration, you will see that the government of the United States is not very big. Uh, there's, you know, there, there's a customs house and there's a post office and and there's the remnants of the army, and that's about it. There's not very much there. And what happens over time is that the, uh, the uh, institutions of government get built out. And as they get built out, uh, immediately constitutional debates break out over uh, how shall they be built out. And so what happens is politicians um, uh, you know, essentially say, well, we're gonna build it out this way rather than this way. This is what we're gonna do rather than this. And each time that they make a decision about how to build out the constitution or build something new, create a new institution, for example, a constitutional question arises as to whether or not what they're doing is within their powers under the constitution. And thus, the act of building out the constitution over time in institutions, practices, and conventions can be understood as a kind of construction. 
construction, in this case, by the political branches. Now, it may well be, and it often was the case in the early republic, that uh, politicians would give elaborate constitutional arguments for why their constructions were consistent with the constitution. And there are many, many famous examples of politicians making these kinds of elaborate arguments about uh, why this construction rather than that construction is constitutional. But the important point uh, is that the difference between judicial construction and these other kinds of constructions is judicial constructions result in doctrines. Uh, whereas these constructions result in institutions, practices, and conventions. And they give rise to new constitutional problems. So once you create a, a Federal Reserve Bank, uh, once you create uh, a, Nash, uh, a Department of Defense, uh, once you create a Justice Department, uh, once you create a Department of Homeland Security, these are all institutions created under the auspices of the Constitution, a whole series of constitutional problems will then arise uh, out of what you've built. And those will get decided either by judges, so they'll create new doctrine, or they'll be decided in politics, depending upon the nature of the, of the issue. So as a result, there's a kind of dialectic, and it, actually this is a very important and powerful dialectic in American constitutional development, a dialectic between constructions and claims of constitutional power, authority, or right made by people in politics, uh, made by politicians or social movements, and then judicial constructions, which are in response to the kinds of constructions that are made in politics. Uh, and the result of the judicial responses or non-responses, sometimes judges don't say anything, uh, is that uh, you know, the constitution practice changes and that pushes the system forward over time. So that in effect, the fact that you have a framework, the fact that both the judiciary engages in construction and the political branches engage in construction, and that they are in some sense responding to each other and building on what each other has done, sometimes wanting to tear down what the other has done, that drives the process of constitutional uh, uh, development forward over time. So that by the time we get to 2021, the American constitutional system is complex, complicated, full of different doctrines, uh, uh, practices and conventions, none of which, or most of which weren't really around at the time the document starts uh, its journey through time. And now uh, that's the place I, where I want to conclude. Uh, I have more to say, I have lots more to say actually. I'm a law professor, but I thought this would be a good place to conclude by noting that this means that the particular version of originalism that I'm offering, that is framework originalism, has important ideas that are related to another branch of constitutional theory in the United States, which is called living constitutionalism. Uh, living constitutionalism argues that uh, the meaning of the Constitution, and here the word meaning is very unclear, the meaning of the Constitution changes or should change over time in order to adapt to new uh, circumstances. Now, I, uh, so everything is baked into what's meant by the word meaning. Um, but here's the way I would put it. Uh, if you're claiming that the, me the original meanings of the terms in the Constitution can be altered without amendment, if that's what you are trying to say by referring to meaning, then I don't agree. My view is the original meanings of the terms stay the same until they're altered by amendment, but constructions can change and constructions have changed over time. But if all you're saying is that the constitution is a framework built out over time with a series of constructions by the judiciary and the political branches, which interact with each other and play off each other and driving the system, the development of the system forward over time, well, I do agree with that. Uh, that's actually what happened. Uh, so I not only believe it, I've seen it done, as they say about baptism. Um, uh, so um, uh, that's to that extent, living constitutionalism makes sense. It makes sense as an account of the processes of constitutional change. Um, so uh, it's also important to understand, and here's where, here's where I want to I want to close. Uh, some important differences between, so I just told you an important difference between my project and what is often thought of as living constitutionalism. Let me say a few differences about the, uh, my project and what is generally thought to be or often claimed to be originalist in the United States. So uh, I have what you would call a thin theory of original meaning, which is that how people expected or anticipated uh, the text would be applied in particular concrete controversies is not part of the original meaning. So it's thin in the sense that it's not thickened by the understandings and expectations of the people uh, who adopted the text. Rather, the text is the law. The text is what we apply over time. We, uh, uh, we apply the original meaning, but how we apply it over time, that's a question of construction. 
Secondly, I don't uh, subscribe to the position that many of my fellow originalists do, which is that uh, you can thicken out the original meaning by uh, referring to the original legal construction of the text. So that is to say, the way to find out what the Equal Protection Clause means today is to ask what a well-trained lawyer in 1868 would have uh, thought uh, the language meant, that is to say, what set of legal concepts or doctrines followed from the terms equal protection, and that would, we would trace that back to the history of the term uh, in law. Uh, my view is that you only do that if you have a, uh, a legal term of art, uh, uh, a bill of attainder, for example, and that still is subject to common law evolution because it's a common law term. Uh, but with respect to most of the constitution, most of the constitution is not legal terms of art. Most of the constitution was written for ordinary citizens to understand and should be understood in the way an ordinary citizen would understand it. Uh, so in that sense, it is also a thin theory of original meaning. Uh, and that also means that the room, there will be greater room for construction uh, and building out over time under my theory than there would be on other different kinds of originalist theories. Now, the last thing I wanna say, uh, you probably have heard about the difference between originalism and living constitutionalism. But the thing I want you to understand in the United States is that originalism and living constitutionalism are basically twins separated at birth. They both arise at the same time. They arise at the beginning of the 20th century and they both arise in order to deal with a problem uh, which is that by the time you get to the turn of the 20th century, the American constitution uh, has changed so much uh, from the constitution of 1789 in terms of its actual praxis, how it actually works, that there is a question as to you know, what it means to be faithful to it. And so what you get are two different moves, which we see over and over again in culture, in religion, and in politics. There are two standard uh, responses to uh, uh, change of this sort. I would call the problem of modernity, that is constitutional modernity. One response is that that was then, this is now, and we have to adapt to the world as we see it now. We have to be modern, right? So what you do with modernity is you adapt to it. You, 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 know, you, you lean into it. You say, oh, that, that, you know, we're, we're, we're getting better. The second response to modernity is to say, no, 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 we've strayed from the path. We have to return. We have to restore what we lost. So something's been lost and we have to get back to it. Um, and that's the other standard response to uh, the, 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 the sense of modernity. And we see it in culture, we see it in, in religion, we see it in politics. But my point is, is that both of these moves are always going on in the context of legal argument in the United States. So that originalists engage in what looks like a restorative project, but they actually are also adapting all the time. Uh, they're, you know, they're adapting as fast as they can. And living constitutionalists claim that they're thoroughly modern. Uh, you know, we adapt to the times, but actually they're always invoking the framers, the founders, the founding ideals. And so what we see is that although they seem to be opposed, in fact, they are twins separated at birth. And why are they twins separated at birth? because both of them face the same problem. The problem is the problem of legitimacy, political legitimacy. All theories of constitutional interpretation at the end of the day have to be based on some conception of what makes a constitution legitimate. And there's a very simple answer to this question, but it's not the answer that most people give. What makes a constitution legitimate, at least in the United States, and this is why Canada it strikes me as different. Canada has a, has a different history and its constitution is the product of of uh, uh, its status under British rule and then the, the charter. Uh, but in the United States, what made the constitution legitimate is it was an act by the people of the United States, an act of popular sovereignty, which was then carried forward because the Americans had adopted a certain conception of the rule of law. And that was the source of its legitimacy. But over time, because the constitution became, uh, it was so long lived, it, it lasted much longer than anybody thought it would. Uh, then there had to be a second source of legitimacy in addition to it's uh, the initial act of popular sovereignty plus the rule of law. And that had to be the fact that the constitution had to be understood as somehow reflecting and being the work of each successive generation of Americans. That is each successive generation of Americans had to say to themselves, that's my constitution. It belongs to me. It's, the, you know, it's like the work of my hands. It's what I do. Right? And so that meant that there always had to be a way for constitutional interpretation to reflect that other source of legitimacy. That is the legitimacy of successive generations who wanted to claim the constitution as their own. Both living constitutionalism, 
and a ritualism have to solve that problem, the two different sources of legitimacy. They solve it, however, in different ways, and they emphasize some elements over other elements. But don't let that fool you. Both of them sit, face the same problem, and that's why they really are twins separated at birth. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Balkin. Uh, my delegation to you, you were a good faith agent of the time, uh, the, time <laughs> the time allotment, which was open-ended, so thank you. Uh, Professor Sirota, are you ready to provide a response and uh, put some of this in a Canadian context? Uh, thank you, Mark. Th thanks, uh, Tim, also for, for inviting me. And uh, thank you so much, Professor Balkan. It's, it's a real honor for me to, to be part of this uh, event and uh, quite a challenge to, to, to respond to a presentation that's uh, so rich. Uh, and I read some of Professor Balkan's work in preparation for this. I read it some of it before as well, but uh, this is still quite an ask. So, and I don't have too much time. I will also try to be a good faith agent. I'll have a few comments and then if I'm, uh, maybe I will also have time for, to get a few questions in as well. Uh, first comment I would like to make is about the relevance of talking about the regionalism generally in Canada, because uh, Canadian Legal academics often say that this is a waste of time. This is a, an American affectation. This is not something that we do in Canada at all. Uh, they are wrong. The uh, Supreme Court of Canada regularly, well, regularly is not a good word because it's, um, there's nothing regular about it, but frequently engages in uh, various forms of originalist reasoning uh, at the risk of uh, tooting my own horn. Uh, Benjamin Oliphant and I have published a very long article in the UBC Law Review a few years ago uh, cataloging a lot of uh, what the Canadian courts have done, uh, probably not all of it even by then, and there have been more examples since then. Uh, for those listeners who are going to make it to the Runnymede conference in a month or two, uh, I think I'm going to be speaking about some recent cases there that also go in that direction. Uh, and if you want just one case, uh, it's not the best known Canadian case, but it's a, a case called Cajon and Alberta uh, from 2015, I think, uh, in, in which both the majority and the dissenting opinion are thoroughly originalist. The majority practices public meaning originalism, the dissent practices original intent originalism. So you can see what those two things look like uh, and um, see that Canadian courts is just one example among many. So we should be talking about originalism and trying to understand it. And we are very fortunate for that reason to have Professor Balkan uh, with us. Uh, Specifically, his conception of originalism, framework originalism, as he describes it, is perhaps especially relevant to uh, Canadians. And it's relevant because it is very close to the understanding of the Constitution that I think is expressed in the best known Canadian case on constitutional interpretation. Uh, the so-called Persons case, Edwards and the Attorney General of Canada. In Edwards, uh, the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council, which at the time was the highest court uh, of appeal for Canada, uh, launches this metaphor of the Canadian Constitution as a living tree on which the Supreme Court of Canada 50 years later ceases to proclaim its allegiance, uh, ostensible allegiance, uh, and not a very faithful allegiance, but ostensible allegiance to living constitutionalism. So let me read to you what Lord Sankey says for the Judicial Committee. He says, the BNA Act planted in Canada a living tree capable of growth and expansion. This is the most famous part of that passage, the part that everybody knows, the, uh, what we now call the Constitution Act 1867, a living tree. Lord Sankey continues, capable of, of growth and expansion within its natural limits. That part is also relatively well known, uh, although not as publicized. Lord Sankey continues, 
The object of the act was to grant a constitution to Canada. Lord Sankey then quotes from Sir Robert Borden, a former prime minister who wrote uh, an article, I think, uh, or a book, and said, like all written constitutions, it has been subject to development through usage and convention. This is part of what we have heard from Professor Balkan today. Lord Sankey continues, their lordships do not conceive it to be the duty of this board. It is certainly not their desire to cut down the provisions of the act by a narrow and technical construction, but rather to give it a large and liberal interpretation so that the dominion to a great extent, but within certain fixed limits, may be mistress in her own house, as the provinces, to a great extent, but within certain fixed limits, are mistresses in theirs. As I see it, the living tree to which Lord Sankey refers is the construction, and especially the political construction, which Professor Balkan described to us today. The issue in the person's case is whether the governor general, for which read the federal executive, the federal government of Canada, could appoint women to the Senate, so long as they met the other requirements that were uh, imposed for senators. Uh, and the uh, Privy Council, Lord Sankey says, this case is not about the rights of women. Women, just like men, don't have a right, an individual right, to be appointed to the Senate, of course. This is about the right to, of the governor general to appoint whom uh, he wants as senators. Now, it's tempting to say, well, his lordship protests too much. But what I think the better way to understand this is that this really is a case about whether the executive can adopt a new practice. The old practice from 1867 to 1930 was to only appoint men. Now the executive is desirous of changing its ways for the better in accordance with more modern, more progressive understandings. Uh, and uh, the question is whether the executive has the liberty to do that. That's the question that Lord Sackey is answering in this case. So I think that the, the living tree to which uh, Lord Sankey refers, just like the living constitution, as Professor Balkin describes it, is what happens when uh, political actors in particular are developing and changing their practices and they, within those fixed limits, are uh, authorized to grow that living tree. Now, Lord Sankey emphasizes, and perhaps to a greater extent than Professor Balkan would, Lord Sankey says, speaks of fixed limits. Lord Sankey in a different case, in a case called the aeronautics reference, which is decided just a couple of years after Edwards, uh, speaks of the original contract under which the provinces have decided to federate, which cannot be changed by judicial interpretation. Now, this I think is also in line with what Professor Balkin says, that the uh, framework to the extent that it has been fixed, must remain fixed. The words don't change their meaning. But as Professor Balkin alluded to, one question which divides him from other originalists, including those who accept the basic uh, premise of uh, a distinction between constitutional interpretation and constitutional construction, uh, I'm thinking of Randy Barnett, who spoke to the Randy Mead conference last year. So there is a handy recording of, of that uh, for our Canadian listeners. You can listen to that. Uh, I'm thinking of uh, Lawrence Solom, perhaps as well. Uh, so one difference is how, how much does each originalist uh, theorist or indeed each originalist judge, as Lord Sankey was, I think, uh, how much do we think has been fixed in the moment of uh, the framing of the constitutional text. How uh, thick or thin, to use Professor Balkin's uh, lang uh, language, uh, how thick or thin is the original text? Uh, the other difference 
about which perhaps he, uh, Professor Balkan hasn't said quite as much is what are the, the limits and the purposes of uh, judicial construction? Uh, some originalist theorists, I think, would have uh, much more elaborate, stricter uh, theory of construction in which they, they would want, for example, judges to respond and implement uh, the original purposes of constitutional framers as opposed to more modern conceptions of what the constitution is for. Now, these are all, I think, spectra. These are, there's shades of gray in, uh, in these, uh, so there is, it's not that there is a thick constitution or a thin constitution. There is, uh, there is obviously a range of how thick or thin you think the constitution's uh, language is. There is a range of degrees of constraint that uh, theory of construction might impose uh, on judges. Uh, but um, again, uh, and I will conclude, I, I, I think I will just conclude with that. Uh, I, I do think that uh, the framework originalism uh, theory that Professor Balkin uh, explained to us today is, is not only a very interesting theory uh, for us to uh, grapple with as an intellectual game, uh, although it is an interesting theory, but I would say that it is much more than that including for Canadians, despite what we sometimes hear about the meaning of uh, the person's case in particular and about what our constitution is uh, in particular, I think this is uh, a theory which is at least closely akin to, if not for the reasons uh, to which I've alluded, if not necessarily uh, identical in all particulars, but it's closely akin to that which animated uh, foundational cases on constitutional interpretation, which unfortunately we tend to misunderstand now, uh, and which also I would suggest animates more uh, modern cases, more contemporary cases, uh, even though I haven't spoken about those. Uh, I think we um, Perhaps, perhaps we'll uh, continue that uh, conversation uh, at the Runnymede conference uh, in a few weeks' time. So thank, thank you very much. And I'm, again, very honored and, and grateful to have been uh, part of, of this conversation. OK, thank you, uh, Leonid. Um, we can go to questions now, unless Professor Balkin has a response he wants to provide to that. Um, I, I did have one thing I wanted to say. Sure, that, that yeah. I, Amplify something that uh, Leonid was was making, point he was making. He asked, well, you know, how do you construct? So if you have a thin account of original meaning, then what, how you construct becomes extremely important because otherwise you could do anything, you see? So in my view, uh, construction itself has all sorts of, of constraints on it and limits on it. But uh, the way I describe them is different than many of my other originalist friends do. Um, so Randy Barnett, for example, his view is that in construction, uh, you must always attempt to uh, further the original purposes of the Constitution and the, the basic structural assumptions of the Constitution, right? And so all construction has to be guided by that. And that seems very sensible to me. Uh, but I, I look at it slightly differently. Uh, so when the Constitution is adopted, uh, there is a period of about uh, 10 years in which it's not quite clear at all how to interpret it. There had been nothing like this before uh, in the United States. There were analogies, common law analogies, treaties, uh, contracts, uh, requests, wills. Uh, there, had, there were state constitutions, but they weren't federal constitutions. And so they're, they're, everybody is, is basically trying to think, well, how do we interpret this? And so uh, you might get the sense from reading the literature in this that, that it was clear that there was originalist methodology as of 1789, and, and they just applied it. And that's just not true. There was enormous dispute and dissensus and disagreement about how to interpret. But within about 10 years or so, they start to move toward a, a sort of standard toolkit. And that standard toolkit cool with some dis, uh, differences is pretty much what we have today. First of all, they treat the text as a text. That is, they treat it not as the way we think of 
of texts in the British constitution as being uh, as having principles emanating from them that can apply regardless of the actual language of the text. So Magna Carta is a wonderful example, but instead they treat the constitution as a text and therefore it's to be interpreted as a text. And then at that point, they start to bring a whole set of traditional common law approaches to it. They ask, you know, what are the canons of construction? Uh, what is the purpose of the text? What are the structures? that are implicit in the text, what structural principles are emanate from the text, uh, uh, what, uh, what precedents do we have that we can use to argue, uh, what are the existing practices we have that we've inherited, how, can, how do they apply or fill out the text. Uh, well, many of them believe strongly in natural law and natural rights, so are these, what kind of rights are rights which uh, governments are instituted to protect? They would ask questions like that. They'd ask questions about political tradition. They'd ask questions about national ethos, about the character of the country and what its basic commitments were. So all of these were techniques of, of construction that they brought to bear in the constitution really from relatively early time, although they disagreed about how to use them. And those basic techniques, those basic topoi, if you like the uh, rhetorical idea, those have con uh, had contained with us. Those are what structure and constrain construction. The use of these very standard techniques inherited from the common law and applied to the problem of interpreting a constitutional text. And what that means is, is that when you're in the world of construction, you're in the world of better and worse. Not anything goes. There are better and worse constructions. And how do you show they're better or worse? That you use, you show that they're better or worse by applying these very standard techniques of construction, which come from the common law. But I, I, I just want to say that when Randy says you should apply consistent with purpose and structure, I say, absolutely, Randy, that's, that's fine by me. But those are questions of construction as opposed to questions of what's baked into original meaning. So you understand that when you move something into the world of construction, it requires judgment, judgment from which you cannot escape. So that the, the judge and the, the political branches who engage in construction are always condemned to have to judge. They have to make decisions. They have to figure out what's better or worse. And that's the basic predicament of constitutional interpretation. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Leonid, did you want to say anything as a final response before we move to the questions or? No, I know. I think we should just move to, okay. to the okay. questions. Okay, good. Okay, so questions. Um, we have one in the chat here. I, I do see Professor Frock's hand up. Uh, let's go to Professor Frock and then we'll read this in the comment uh, section here after. So Professor Frock, go ahead. Hi, um, it's a real pleasure to uh, see you Professor Balkan um, on virtual Canadian soil, if not uh, actual Canadian soil. But uh, the question that I have um, kind of springs forth, I think, from your comments about, um, you know, the benefits of originalism, especially uh, your variety of originalism, which leaves a, law, a large margin for co the construction phase, um, because uh, a lot of originalists uh, defend um, their pet uh, theory on the basis that originalism constrains, so you don't get judges running amok, um, you know, that kind of thing. I don't think you asp necessarily espouse to that philosophy, but how do you explain um, the benefits of originalism um, compared to a, a living constitutionalism approach? Well, remember, I'm both. So I, uh, I, you get two for the price of one with me. Uh, what I would say is that uh, there are a group of living constitutionalists, David Strauss uh, is one at the University of Chicago, who don't think we're actually bound by the text. And his, his view, the only reason that we, uh, that the text is irrelevant, the text doesn't really, um, uh, it doesn't really do very much work. Uh, and that the only reason why we abide by things, we seem to abide by things, that are in the text is because they're a useful focal point for coordination. Um, and I think that doesn't actually capture the constitutional culture of the United States. And this is actually one of the things I was interested in talking about in the context of Canada. I think the, the culture of the United States um, is strongly textualist. It's textualist in the sense that it sees that, uh, by the way, you should understand, what I mean by textualism is that you start with a text when you engage in interpretation. So you can be a textualist and an originalist, I am. You can be a textualist, but not an originalist, as many of my 
uh, uh, friends are. You can be a ritualist and not a textualist if you think that what's fixed is intention, not text, uh, right? And you can be neither, which there are some people like that too. So uh, I think that what's characteristic of the American constitutional culture is its textualism. So there is this moment in the Democratic National Com uh, Convention in which uh, Kizer Khan uh, holds up a copy of the Constitution uh, and she says, Donald Trump, this is the Constitution. Have you read it? Well, I don't know. Do people do this in Canada? Do they hold up copies of the Charter and say, have you read the Charter? Uh, I don't know. Is, is that a Canadian thing? Well, my uh, students love getting a, a, a copy of the Charter. You can get them for free, so I distribute them. So there's a little bit, but I don't think... They, do they wave I copies think. of the of the Constitution Act of 1867 as well? <laughs> no, I don't think they do. I don't think they do. Do they wave all the all the, the features of the British Constitution that were imported into the Canadian? I don't think they do either. So in other words, what I'm trying to say is, this is what I'm going to say. There's something about the American uh, legal culture that thinks it's very important that you start with a text. And I think originalism has captured that. It captures that commitment to the text. But also, and this is now I'm going to get very religious, there's a kind of Protestant idea involved too. So when you carry your own copy of the Constitution, right, it's the Protestant idea of the priesthood of all believers. Everybody has access to the text. It's not just for a group of priests or, you know, of people who basically know the secret. Uh, it's avail It's democratic. Everybody has, avail has the text available to them. It's originalism, properly done, I want to point out, not <laughs> all versions, carries that idea too, this idea, this Protestant idea that the Constitution belongs to everyone. Everybody can interpret it for themselves. Uh, everybody, it's a priesthood of all believers. Uh, obviously, I have, and that's why I always emphasize uh, the, um, I always emphasize the, uh, the idea that it's the what the text means to the ordinary person. Uh, not uh, that it's not a text that's full of a set of legal terms of art, although my, my friends Mike Rappaport and John Beginnis, that's where we disagree. It's all terms of art. It's all it's a lawyer's, it's a lawyer's constitution. Whereas my view is it's a people's contract. That's that's how I would sell ritualism to people. Great. Okay. Uh, we have some people on the phone, so I'll read the, one of the questions out in the comment box here, and this can go, I think, to either uh, Professor Balkan or Leonid. Ed. Is the living, living tree an instrument of judicial activism uh, slash striking down laws adopted by elected governments, or is it intended to facilitate upholding policies adopted by the elected branches? One uh, of you want to deal with that question? Uh, well, Professor Rona, please first tell me what you uh, what uh, what you understand the situation to be. Yeah, because they extrapolate from my very primitive understanding. So I think it 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 can be probably both of these things. Now it, it and a lot will depend on what your theory of uh, of construction will be. So if we take uh, the, again, the example of the person's case, uh, that's an example where the uh, court clearly says, look, this is, uh, it's not our intention to cut down. So the, the living tree stands for, uh, I would say, the constitution is just what happens in this famous British phrase. The living tree stands for what has been constructed, uh, as Professor Balkin would perhaps say. And so in the person's case, Lord Sankey says, it's not the intention of the, of the judicial committee to cut down the living tree. We are, we are not going to stand in the way. I don't think... It, the court's role is necessary to facilitate anything, but the court is not going to go out of its way to uh, prevent the political branches from doing anything by uh, resorting to some uh, unusual narrow construction. Uh, that said, if your theory of construction, and, and so this depends on the case, uh, it's, it, it's a case by case thing, but at least in some, and perhaps quite a few cases, if your theory of construction is, uh, for example, that uh, something like uh, Professor Burnett's view that you know, the uh, courts should also be faithful agents who implement uh, the, the original purposes of the, uh, of the constitution, uh, which 
in some moods at least, I think is actually fairly close to what the Supreme Court of Canada thinks it does. Uh, at least its understanding of the purposes of the constitution. Um, then in many cases, those purposes uh, will be at odds with the policies of the elected representatives. And, and I will in, indeed, I will go so far as to turn perhaps the question around and say, well, what are the elected representatives uh, getting up to? Are they engaged in good faith uh, constitutional construction? Are they thinking about what the constitution allows or doesn't allow them to do? And if they actually do that, they will perhaps find that some of the things that poll well and that they might be otherwise tempted to do are not good faith constructions of the constitution. And then if, again, if they take this sort of responsibility seriously, they will not enact those policies and the courts will have no uh, cause to intervene. But if the uh, political, uh, well, in the United States, let's say political branches, we would just say legislatures uh, and mean the, their masters in the executive branch. Uh, if, uh, if the governments disregard the charter, uh, for example, or if they disregard the Constitution Act 1867 and the division of powers, and they make indeed a point of uh, enacting legislation that uh, they know will get into trouble with the courts, then uh, I think on many theories of construction, uh, it will be appropriate for the courts to strike down those laws. Uh, and I would suggest that those theories of construction are probably better than the ones that would counsel uh, judicial abstention in the face of political branches that are uninterested in the constitution for themselves. Okay, uh, in the interest of time, we'll move to the next uh, question, I guess, for, uh, from Gareth. Hi, Gareth, good to see you. Um, his question is, one of the major reasons Canadian judges go back to the origin uh, is the idea of the compact. So with the parties to the original Confederation compact always being contested and expanding over time. So I guess this is a question for Professor Balkan. How much do you see this sort of language of compact uh, in the United States in, in discussions of originalism? Well, uh, compact is probably the wrong word to use yeah. in an American context because there is a theory called the state compact theory, uh, which is used at various points in American history. Uh, this theory, I think Justice Thomas still uh, holds on to it, but this theory is not uh, held generally in, in good stead. Uh, it, it, uh, several people said it was decisively rejected on the, on the battlefields of Gettysburg. Um, and that, uh, 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 you know, it's, it's the theory of nullification uh, uh, and uh, interposition and secession, uh, which these are not words that we, we like to use in the United States. Uh, but uh, abstracting away from that particular word and instead focusing on this, I think that if what you're having is a fight over the original uh, compact uh, between the various parts of Canada, what you're really doing is having a dispute about the principles of subsidiarity and federalism uh, in, in the union. That is, you're having a, you're having a fight over what was, uh, you know, what, how was the thing supposed to work? How was this machine supposed to work? What was the purpose of creating a union? Uh, these are classic questions of construction. Uh, these are, these are the, the tropes or what uh, Philip Bob would call the modalities uh, of uh, construction. One has to do with purpose. What was the purpose? What was the point of this enterprise? And the other is structure, which is how are the different parts supposed to work? What was assigned to each? What were the responsibilities and competences that were assigned to each? That's what I think is going on. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions coming up? Uh, it's eight o'clock now, so we should uh, probably have a last call for questions here in the interest of time. If there are any. I think everybody's been won over. That's all I can say. That, well, if that's the case, then uh, we're, we're in good stead. Okay, well, if there are no other questions, uh, let me take this opportunity then to uh, close up. Um, just again, thank you, Professor Balkan, for your time today. Uh, really appreciate it. Thank you, Professor Sirota, for your response. Uh, thank you to the University of Saskatchewan chapter of Running Me, Tim, uh, and the team there for all the work in putting this event together.
Really appreciate it. Uh, if you're interested in these event in these sorts of topics, originalism, we're going to be talking about this at our conference, Running Me Conference, March 12th and 13th. It'll be happening virtually. Uh, we'll be talking about the context of uh, of originalism in Canada, so a, a more of a Canadian focus. So, looking forward to seeing you all then. Thank you again to our speakers, uh, and have a good evening, everyone. Thank you always. It was a pleasure. It was great. Thank, Thank you, Professor Walton. Thank you, Professor Walton. Yeah.